Hello, everyone, and welcome to Catholic Truth Family, where we help you to find love, relationships, and happily ever after. Whether you're single, dating, engaged, or married, we give you the advice that you need to grow and to flourish in relationships and to avoid the common pitfalls that so many people fall into, which prevents them from finding love and happiness and fulfillment in life. And on this channel, we have many, many talks on different topics dating, engagement, marriage, children. And sometimes we have guests as well. And one of our regulars is Julie Loin. And Julie Loin is a stay-at-home mom with, I have no idea what your bio is because I forgot to bring it up. <laughs> Let's start over. <laughs> oh, that was such a good intro too. Whoops. <clears throat> you should just go with it. I think people would find it funny. <laughs> <laughs> I may, I might. Let's see. All right. I will edit that out or maybe not. All right. And sometimes on our show, we have guests and uh, we have a wonderful guest today. Uh, her name is Julie Loin and she's a wonderful stay-at-home mom. And she has a degree in theology and catechetics from Franciscan University with a background in music and theater. Before having children, she was a high school religion teacher and she is a writer and a podcaster. She's been married for 11 years, has homeschooled for beautiful children and her husband and her have a music ministry with children, leading them in adoration. People say that kids can't go to adoration because they're too young. Well, no, they can. In fact, I did a retreat, an eighth grade retreat, sorry, side point, where uh, I was going to do an adoration with uh, eighth graders. And this, uh, these eighth graders, the lady didn't want it because she, oh, she, they're too young. They can't sit and pray for an hour before Jesus. I was like, well, it's guided, blah, blah, blah. She's like, I don't want it. 15 minutes tops. So I put a, an hour in the schedule anyways. And uh, after like 50 minutes, I couldn't even find the lady. I was like, did she leave? Is she mad at me? She was, I found her finally. She came out of the bathroom and she had lost her makeup. She had like crying so hard. She was like, she's like, honey, I've been doing this a long time and I've never seen anything like this. These kids have been here almost an hour and they don't want to leave and their lives are being changed. She's like, I've never seen anything like it. So, you know, it really can be powerful if we leave kids to Christ and uh, teach them. Yeah, I love that. I I've heard so many stories of people. They assume that kids can't handle something like that. And ours is with the caveat of it's going to be loud. So we have my husband and I do the music and our priest is absolutely amazing. He gets the kids engaged in what's happening. And um, he, we do a procession with the Eucharist and it's beautiful, but we just have the understanding that with a lot of little kids, it's going to be loud. And we have our two-year-old who will literally climb up my back while I'm in the middle of singing a song and my husband's playing guitar and our four-year-old is crawling under the pew. And it is just like, this is where we're at right now. And, and our kids are reverent, but when mommy and daddy are not able to like <laughs> sit with them and show them, we're trying to play music. And it's just, it is absolutely amazing. And the kids love coming. And then afterwards we have, um, we, have we should have a whole now. show on this in the future too. I would love just to yeah. talk about your kids with you know, adoration, praying with kids and that sort of thing, how to do it. I think that would be important. It is um, so important. So important. But today we're going to be talking about marriage. We're actually starting a series on marriage, on how to have a wonderful marriage, a great marriage. I mean, they say at least half the marriages in this country fail and fear in inner cities. It can be up to 75% divorce rate, but even people who are in marriage many times aren't happy. <clears throat> Sorry for my throat, everybody. I have allergies. Welcome spring. Um, but a lot of people just aren't happy in marriage. A lot of people go through difficult times. A lot of people are unfulfilled. A lot of people fall in love and then they fall out of love and they just spend a miserable, lonely time in marriage. So we really want to help you no matter where you're at in your marriage to have a great marriage, to have a healthy marriage, a fruitful marriage, one that brings joy and peace and fulfillment and not the other way around. And so there's many things. I mean, there's, I have a bookshelf, a lot of bookshelves in this room, but I have one bookshelf in the background that that whole second shelf is all marriage books, dating books, relationship books. And there's so many people who fall into the pitfalls of common relationship problems, and they don't know how to get out because nobody teaches us how to do it. So we're going to be starting and talking about a lot of these things in marriage. And today we're going to be talking about the five love languages, which is insanely important. If people I knew actually knew this, they probably wouldn't have gotten divorced. They probably wouldn't feel like their spouse doesn't love them. They probably wouldn't feel like they're the only ones giving in the relationship and not receiving anything in return. And keep in mind, both sides are saying that 
you know, I'm giving more than she is. I'm giving more than he is. He doesn't give enough, which may or may not be true. But, you know, in our minds, we're always giving more and they're not giving anything. And I think there's a little thing that I discovered many years ago, and it's called love languages, loving your spouse the way they need to be loved and not the way that you feel like loving them. And I'm going to repeat that because it's important. The love languages are really about loving your spouse the way they need to be loved and not the way you feel like loving them. So, Julie, you know, where do we start with this? I mean, I have a lot to say on it myself because it's, I've learned so much about it, but, you know, where do we start? Like, what are the love languages and what do they mean to us in marriage? Um, I think that is such a great question. Where do you start? Where do you start with marriage? The topic is endless. And so Brian did a great job of trying to hone in what we're going to talk about today. And the five love languages, there are some um, psychologists, psychiatrists that say, if people only knew, this is actually the most important part. So the five love languages are the way people receive love and give love. And I'm not an expert on this, but there's a great book, The Five Love Languages, that if you want to really dive into is absolutely amazing. Brian, I'm sure you have it on your shelf. I do. Uh, I could see yeah. it from here. Yeah. So it's it's, <clears throat> a, it's it's a quick read, an easy read. Um, but the five lo- love languages are quality time, words of affirmation, physical touch, gift giving, and oh, I was hoping not to have to look. Uh, what did I acts miss? Acts of service. Oh, uh, did I do acts? Yes. Did you number say one that? on my list, acts of service. So <laughs> I'll repeat those. I'll repeat those. Acts of service, physical touch, gift giving, words of affirmation, and quality time. So I think the understanding of knowing what each of these are and knowing how you want to receive love and how your spouse wants to receive love is by these five love languages. They're and I think some people even <clears throat> some people even break them down, you know, to like some people are more visual. And so, you know, they, you know, if you speak to them, Hey, I love you. And I'm going to call you up on the phone and leave you this love language, this long message about how much I love you. The people that could be like, Oh, that was sweet, you know, but they're not going to really feel loved. It's not going to help them. Whereas if you take the time to write them a love letter, instead they see it because they're visual and they're like, wow, that's great. Whereas other visual people might, you know, leave a treasure hunt for their, you know, spouse and the people who are audio and like love to hear you know, and this doesn't really, I mean, it sort of applies, but people who love to hear, I love you. They like to have long conversations. They like to go deep in that relationship for them to see things. It's not going to speak to them. So, you know, these love languages are all about helping them to be loved the way they feel loved. So sorry, you know, I know you're on a tangent there, but I just, it just reminded me of that. It's because I'm very visual and, you know, like if someone says, I love you, that's great. I love to hear it, but it's not the same as in a sense, showing me, you know, that's funny. You said that. Cause my husband wrote, um, a little, a little piece of papers, like literally just something ripped out and he wrote, I love you on it. And he put it in my car, like where the, the gas gauge thing is. And I have it there. This was probably five years ago and I still have it. There. And it just, it's that constant reminder of like, he took the time out to do that. And it's so simple, but it really did make me feel loved. And I still feel loved to this day by that little act. Aww. So the visual is huge. Absolutely. Um, And I wanted, I wanted to kind of give some examples and Brian, I'm sure you're going to have a lot of examples too, is when love languages can go wrong, because I think if someone's like, I am pouring out my love on this person and they're unhappy and they're mean to me and they're, they're giving me the cold shoulder, but all I'm doing is showing them love. That's great. But if you're showing them the wrong kind of love. Right. I shouldn't say wrong. If you're showing them the uh, an opposite type of love that they want, it's not going to be fulfilling them. It's not going to fill their tank. So they talk about like the tank, you know, you want to fill your spouse or if, you know, with certain things that might actually empty them. So one of the examples I love is um, let's say your spouse is all about quality time, but you are off at work all the time. You are staying late. You are choosing to stay late at work until midnight. You come rolling home, you crawl into bed, you wake up, you do the same thing every day. And your spouse is not getting that quality time, but you are sending flowers. You are giving candy. You are telling them how much you love them. That's great. But that's not and even much. more, I'm working my life away to show you I love you. I'm working my yes. life away. So this family has money, you know, but yes. great. Are you spending time with them? You know, like great. You've hit acts of service. You're working hard for the family. (laughs) Exactly. Gift giving. You're giving flowers and candies. You're even telling them your words of affirmation, but you're missing their love language, which is quality time. 
They don't care about those things. They want you to spend time making eye contact, being with them, being present, doing activities with them. And I think if people could just see what their spouse's love language is, they'd be so happy to do it. Right. Most people would be willing to be like, oh, I, if I only knew how to love my spouse and here we go, have it. Usually, usually. <laughs> I say usually because like, even, you know, my wife struggles with my love languages, to be oh, honest. Oh, tell us what they are. Um, <clears throat> I will. But um, like a lot of people find out the other people's love languages and they're like, well, that's not how I like to be loved. And I don't, I don't even understand that. Like, like, why, why would you like to be loved that way? Like they can't relate to it. And so they don't like to do it because it doesn't come easy for them. It's not their first language. Their yes. love language is their first language. Like one of mine is uh, words of affirmation and physical touch or two of mine. And my wife could care less to have physical touch, you know, like she doesn't want to, I mean, yes, I'm, I'm over exaggerating. She does like to hold hands. She does like to, but she's not always wanting to do the kissy kissy or cuddle up on a couch or, you know, that sort of thing <clears throat> as much, you know, as, as me, you know, she, uh, she's like, well, I don't understand why you need so much touch or why don't, you know, why do I need to give you so many hugs or why do I need to give you kisses? You know, that sort of thing. It's like, you know, besides all that, like she did, she's more of a, like when I first met her, she was more stoic, you know, they did. She was more, you know, I want to hear it. I want to see it. I don't want to touch it. You know, like, you know, just show me, you know, like we don't need to actually have a hands-on display. And she didn't, she was uncomfortable with um, um, <clears throat> doing it in public, you know, because of, she didn't like that. But, you know, as she's opened up more over the years, she has become actually more open to that. We do cuddle a lot more on the couch and we do hold hands a lot more. And, you know, she is a lot more open to that, but, you know, I had, a, I had, even now I still give her like, you know, I would like, you know, three kisses a day, two hugs a day, one back rub a week, you know, something like that, like a tangible that she can match up yes. to. And sometimes she meets it. Sometimes she doesn't because she doesn't really, oh, it's not on the front of her. She actually has to work at it. Like it's tough for her. She has to work at it because it's not her first language. And so, um, if you don't mind me saying before you get back to your thoughts on this is, um, Oh my gosh, I have so much to say, but like there's just this thing in marriage. It's the biggest rule of marriage and it's the biggest rule breaker. And my wife and I both say it. Once you get married, you lose the words, that's not me, or I don't, <clears throat> I don't really do that. Or, you know, I can't relate to that. Um, you just want to like remove it from your, you know, vocabulary because the exceptional 7% of marriages do what's best for the other person. So you don't say like, oh, I will, I don't dance. You know, I'm a guy, I don't dance. Well, if your spouse loves dancing, then you want to consider picking that up because it's about her. It's about the other person. It's not about us. And she might say, well, I don't watch football. Well, it's not about you. If your husband loves football, then you should get into that. I'm not saying you need to make dance or football your whole life, but we do need to get into some times what the other person is into. And <clears throat> marriage is supposed to make you uncomfortable because true love is selfless. We get outside of ourselves. I didn't want to salsa dance. My wife salsa danced, but I got into it and I hated it. And I left anger every week because I couldn't do it. But eventually I learned to love it. And now it's our thing. And we go out every week. And so, you know, we've both learned to compromise in different ways. She does things that I don't like. I do things that she doesn't like. And even uh, with my love language, she has had to compromise how she wants to love and how she feels like loving to try to love me better. That's so Does funny. That sense? Oh, totally. And, and uh, going off of that, like it's funny you mentioned football because your salsa dance was my football. So <laughs> Mike, Mike loves football. And my 10 year old is, I mean, so he just is like an encyclopedia of knowledge. So like, if you're like, Hey Pete, what is this? He can rattle off numbers and statistics. He's obsessed with football. I'm like, Oh, great. So you say that. And it's almost like a reminder to me, like, okay, I have to, I have to learn to love it because I love them. And it's so funny that like, you just taught me something, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> it's so beautiful, but it is, it's, it's going outside of ourself because our world right now is very selfish. And our world right now is me focused, me centered and what comes easy. I want ease. I want quick. Um, and so when we focus on those things, then 
having to die to yourself and having to put the other person first can be very painful and very difficult. And it might be really hard at first, but just like salsa dancing came easier to you over time, the love languages do too. It, it is really hard to start a new language. I actually speak no other languages, but I know you do, Brian, you speak Spanish very well. Uh, but I like the love languages really took me some time because my husband and I are complete opposites, just like you and Kathy are. We are complete opposites. We actually, Kathy and I are almost the same in everything. Oh, we have almost the same love languages except touch. Uh, we have almost the same hobbies, likes, desires. Like we're actually very similar to a point where we're even have the same idiosyncrasies and stubbornness and other things as well, which makes us butt heads sometimes. But <laughs> I love it. I love it. But that's the beauty of marriages, they're all different. So so Mike and I have the same interests. Like we love music, we love, um, we love doing these concerts, we love doing the adorations. We have very similar activity styles but our love languages couldn't be any more different. Mm. Uh, mine is like yours. The at, words of affirmation are so important for me. And it, and I think to clarify the love languages, I think it'd be really important for people to understand what they are. I'm not looking for, wow, you're so great. Wow. Look <laughs> at you. High five. That's not the words of affirmation. The words of affirmation. I love, I love when my husband, because it's not his first love languages, love language, he will come home and be like, wow, thank you so much for you know, dealing with the kids all day. I know that was really hard. And I know this kid was sick, or I know this was a really tough time for you because you had to drive this kid. Our, our daughter has appointments up the wazoo. I know this was a really tough day for you. And I'm so thankful that you did it. And it just means so much because I know that's not his natural love language, but he makes sure to tell me things every day, maybe not every day, but frequently that, and it does, it fills my tank because I'm like, Oh, he noticed, you know, he saw, That's great. he saw me and it's beautiful. And, uh, people, if you knew her husband, he doesn't, he's a, he's a man of very few words. Um, he's like, he's kind of like Jesus. He walks, he's silent. Like he just, everyone says they see Jesus in him. Like he even has a beard now. I guess he's trying to be Jesus, but, um, <laughs> but in reality, like he does, when he talks, when he does talk, like he usually has something profound to say when he does talk, you know, like people even ask for his advice. Cause like, he doesn't talk a lot, but it's all the wisdom is in there and people know that. So they come to him. And so for him to go outside of his comfort zone and actually try to like talk and use words, like many men are like, you know, don't like to use words. They like to use hugging. They like to use sex. They like to use, you know, some men will be having sex with their wife and and the wife will be like, I don't know why we just can't communicate. And the husband's like, we're communicating. What are you talking about? We're just, we just hit it off. Like whatever. And it's like, okay, he's communicating maybe with his love language, but not with hers. And she wants a relationship. She wants to hear and seek and speak and feel and that sort of thing. And so for him to get outside of himself and do that shows that he loves you. And that is the proof of love people is if you're willing to get outside of yourself and love the other person the way they need to be loved and the way they uh, desire to be loved. And, you know, Kathy, uh, and it can destroy you too, because Kathy and I's love languages are both words of affirmation, but sometimes we criticize each other a lot and we use words in a destructive way, which makes us both feel unloved. So we've actually had to intentionally and purposely, and I still do even more so work on that. Um, <clears throat> we need to work on how we react to each other, how we speak to each other when we're frustrated, when we, when they don't do something right. I mean, you could be like, I, I've already told you six times and you still don't, don't do it right. Is someone who needs words of affirmation takes that as like, I'm a failure. I can't do anything right. They don't like me. You know, I'm just, and then we build up walls because we want to be loved and we want to show how good we are. So we build up walls of self-defense and we give it right back to them and it becomes this fight. And instead of saying, you know what, you know, I've asked you to do this before, you know, and I know you're good at, you know, tweaking your habits, you know, how do you think, you know, we could work on this for the future? Because it was really important to me that it gets done this way. And, you know, something could be said or something good, or something could be said bad that hurts another person or makes them feel loved even while fixing the problem. Yeah. And I think, I think going on that, the love languages, if used uh, opposite are actually the most harmful. So just like you said, if your love language is words of affirmation and you're attacking that person, it's more painful, more harmful than if you forgot their birthday, because their love language is so deeply rooted inside their soul that when you crush that love language, it just depletes. And I remember talking with someone recently where she has two kids and a baby on the way. And she told me that her husband said 
I wish you didn't dress like that. You dress so frumpy. And her love language is words of affirmation. And so that not only depleted her, but now is stuck in her head that my husband doesn't think I'm beautiful. My husband, my husband thinks that I'm, you know, not worthy of him in some way. And you start spiraling and you start going off on that. And I think the love Mm -hmm. languages can be so, um, awful in that way. If you don't know your spouse's love languages and you pick at them, it's going to, it's going to deplete them. And I was trying to think of what could he have said? And I thought of just something where it was like, okay, if the spouse did think that, okay, my wife dresses frumpy, then it's his job to maybe gift her and say, honey, I saw this at the store. I thought of you and I thought it was so beautiful and it would bring out your eyes and I would love for you to have this gift. Now he's told her she's beautiful. Now he's given her a gift and now he's uplifted her. So it's taking our reaction to our spouse and kind of taking it back. And how can I make this? How can I uplift my spouse? Because most people don't, most people just react. They just kind of attack. So I don't know. I I think when we can know our, our love language, we can tweak how we talk to our spouses. And I wonder how much, uh, I wonder if she feels not beautiful, which is why she's stressing that way. And I do wonder if he complimented her more. And I wonder if he told her how beautiful she is, you know, and, you know, it said, Hey, you know, you remember that thing that you wore like uh, two weeks ago, you looked amazing in that. Like, so instead of focusing on the fact that she looks frumpy, help her tell her how she looks amazing. And you're helping her to see that, you know, and like, I told my wife at the beginning, you know, like, I'm going to be honest with you. You know, if you ask me, you know, if I like something, I'm not going to lie to you and tell you I don't and just tell you, you know, it looks pretty even when it doesn't, because I want there to be trust and honesty between us. And so even though then, you know, but like, you know, I, I'm not gonna be like, oh no, that doesn't look good on you. You know, I might be like, you know, I don't like that particular clothes for today, you know, or, you know, I really like that other thing you wore. I thought that looked amazing. You know, this looks good too, but you know, for maybe for what we're going to the wedding or the party or whatever today, I think this might, you know, fit better, you know? So I try to build her up and I, and I need work on that too, you know, because we've both, we've, we went through a dark time in marriage and we've wounded each other. And, you know, we both, have needed to work, rework on our communication skills. And uh, it's great though, because when you do, <clears throat> love flourishes, love blooms, and we become the people that we were meant to be. And no matter how bad we've done it, you can start over anytime. Yeah. And I, I think if you don't know your spouse's love language, this is a great place to start. Either get the book, find someone yes. who does and go over it and try to figure it out. Um, and I think like Brian said, there's going to be tough patches in your marriage, but that doesn't mean you give up on it. You fight through it. And that was one thing I love. And I'm sure you guys were the same way where even though we had a really, really rocky point in our marriage, we were both willing to fight through it. And Mm -hmm. we want, we actually like sought counseling because we needed a third party to help us through it. We can talk about that on another episode, but I, I just really think that this is such a great starting point for people who say, I, I'm not happy. I'm just not happy in my marriage. And I'm really like, I want out. I I've actually, I've heard that from multiple people. Like I'm actually, I'm reading, I'm reading the annulments. Like I'm reading the pages to see if I like work in this. I'm like, no, no, don't give up. Like, don't like fight through it, but it has to be a team effort. It has to be both of you fighting through it. And I look at people's marriages, Julie, like even my parents who had a miserable marriage their entire life up until maybe 10 years ago, but they were married for, I don't know, 20, 30 years. And they hated each other. They got separated for seven years. They fought constantly. My mother never felt love. My dad never felt love. And it was the classic thing. And he was working two jobs to help support the family, six kids. And he's like, I'm giving, I'm giving, you know, and you don't think I do anything around here. And, you know, and, he, and, and, and my dad's like, and all you do is spend money and all you do is this. And so my mom's love language is definitely words of affirmation. I'm pretty sure. And, um, you know, she's very audio, so he's very critical. So she's never felt love a lot of her life. Whereas my dad's also affirmation, I believe. And, um, Uh, perhaps physical touch and neither of which he received much of, you know, much of his life. And I could just see how they missed each other throughout their life. And they missed loving each other the way that they needed to be loved. And that goes down for the kids too, because each kid has a love language and each kid has a way that they feel loved. And I never felt loved by my parents. Intellectually, I knew they loved me, but they didn't know how to love me the way I needed to be loved. So until I realized that after growing up, I never felt loved as a kid many times. And in fact, I felt unloved, which led to many depressions and low self-esteem and years of searching and doing dumb things, you know? And so I think there might even be a love language for kids. Um, And there's even two good books 
I would recommend two to people. <clears throat> I think they're both rated five stars online. One's called The Temperament That God Gave Your Spouse. And the other one is The Temperament That God Gave You. And the other <clears throat> three books, the other one is that The Temperament That God Gave Your Kids. So you learn about you and your temperament, how you work, how your spouse works, and how you can love them and deal with them and be patient with them. Because a lot of times their temperament drives us crazy after a while, after we get out of the falling and love stage and everything's peachy keen. Now it's just annoying, you know, like, yeah. but, but in reality, it doesn't have to be. We can understand the other and fall in love with the people if we're willing to do the work. And no matter how far gone your marriage is, if you're willing to put the work in, it can, both sides need to be willing to put the work in, but it can be repaired. Yeah. And I, I think it having a saintly marriage, having a, a marriage that is something that brings you peace, brings you joy, brings you everything that you need. Um, obviously God is the ultimate fulfiller, but our spouses are there to help guide us on this path. They're, they're there to help us find our redemption. They're there to help us reach Christ to, to find him as our focus. And if it's not there, then something needs to change. And I think people oftentimes just feel so stuck that this is, mm -hmm. this is their lot. And I actually felt that way. There was a point in our marriage where we were struggling so much where I was like, well, I literally said in my head, I was like, well, this is it now. This is, this is what's going to happen now for the rest of my life, because I just could not see past the hurt, past the frustrations. And I just, I kind of just gave in. And it wasn't until I realized that Mike was willing to fight it with me. And he was like, no, that's not, that's not what we're doing. You know, and, and, <laughs> we're not living this. So we both fought for it and we both changed quite a bit. There was so much that I had to change and things that he had to change. Yes. And it was so beautiful. And I remember coming out of it, people <clears throat> like it was a year later, I look back and I'm like, man, I'm actually almost grateful. We went through that Rocky period because it brought us so much deeper and so much further along. And it doesn't mean we won't have more Rocky patches, but for the time being, <laughs> yeah. And uh, back in the day, you know, my wife and I used to go to, we call them marital spirals. You like go downhill and then you keep going downhill and it just becomes dark and you just don't like each other and that sort of thing. But, you know, over time you learn to recognize what's called um, <clears throat> kind of like the warning signs, the triggers, and I recognize them now. And so instead of sulking for like two days, it might be like, you know, two hours or even two minutes, you know, like or even just 20 minutes, you know, and then like, you know what, Brian, get over yourself. You know, we've worked out bigger things in the past. You just need to stop being hurt so easily and get over it and work it out and um, <clears throat> go apologize. So, you know, <laughs> love is all about that. And guys, the love languages are incredibly important. I see them in marriages all the time. People only love each other the way they feel like loving each other or the way they know how to. But once you can get outside of that, like if you, you know, your <clears throat> husband, let's say, his or your, even your wife, she has uh, quality time. She wants quality time. And as Julie said, you know, you're working all the time. You're not seeing her. You're trying to buy her flowers and you're trying to, you know, do phone calls or, you know, buy her gifts. Those are not replacements for what she actually wants. And if somebody doesn't like quality time and they do like gifts and they like receiving gifts and they like, oh my gosh, you thought of me. Thank you. That made me feel so loved. But you're, you're just trying to force quality. Hey, I want to spend all this time together. I want to, you know, spend over amounts of times when this person may be an introvert, they might need some time to themselves. And you're trying to like over soak them with time. Time, 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 time. When maybe they just need you to give them their own time. Maybe they need you to <clears throat> buy them a time at the spa so they can have that alone time they need. And when they have that, they can recharge. They'll come back and be able to love you even more. So, so you know, it's so important. The five love language is it's a it's a book. Get it, check it out, or you can find um deeper uh, understandings of it online, other YouTube videos, perhaps other articles that have been written on it. I mean, this is a very popular concept. Um, Julie, did you have any other closing thoughts um, before you left? I mean, we just scratched the surface on this topic. Um, the only thing, if you don't mind me ending with uh, my favorite Bible quote, it's one everybody knows. Go for it. Okay. So it just, I mean, it applies to everything with marriage. So this is Ephesians 4, 2 through 3. And this is just, obviously, everybody knows this one. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's really good. Bearing with one another. That's what stuck out to me. Bearing with one another. It's not always going to be easy, but love is patient. Love is kind. People love to read this at mass, but if we actually think about it, this is the recipe for love. It does not, it's not quick to anger. 
it does not brood over injuries. How many times do we get injured over something our spouse says and we sit there brooding on it? How dare they say that? Blah, 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 blah. Love yeah. doesn't do that. Love seeks to work it out as quick as possible. Love communicates in a healthy manner. And we're going to break all of these open on this channel at different times in different videos. So check out our different videos, people, if you haven't. And uh, <clears throat> if you're not familiar with our Catholic Truth uh, channel, if you would like more on other parts of the faith as well, check that out. Julie, there's so much we could talk about, but we will save it for another day. Thank you for joining us today. We appreciate it. Thanks, Brian. Thank you all for tuning in. Please see our show notes below if you want to follow us on social media, if you would like to support our ministry or see what we do. If you would like to bring us into your parish to give a talk on marriage or love, relationships, or anything of the sort, feel free to check out our website, thecatholictruth.org. God bless you all.